Okay, we're going to get started. Um, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar from the National Pesticide Information Center, which is formed through a cooperative agreement between the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and Oregon State University. My name is Alicia Leadham, and I am a senior pesticide specialist here at NPIC. I'm also the webinar facilitator, so you'll see my name on those emails now and in the future. Um, before we get started, I'd like to cover a couple of quick logistics. So I'd like to invite you to please use the Q&A box to ask any questions during the webinar. It should already be addressed to all, and you can keep it that way. That's great. For any questions that aren't answered during or immediately following the webinar, please feel free to use the contact information that we'll provide at the end of the webinar. We are recording today's webinar, so a recorded version of today's webinar will be available soon on the NPIC website and our YouTube channel, likely within the next two weeks but you will receive an email once that video is posted. Today's speaker will be Amy Holman, NPIC project coordinator and a former NPIC pesticide specialist. Amy has several years of experience working within the NPIC database, um, but we also have the database developer, Sean Ross, in attendance so that he'll be here available for questions after the presentation if anything comes up. I'm really looking forward to, to the webinar today, and thank you all for joining. Um, I think you can take it over, Amy. Thanks. Uh, so I wanted to take a minute to thank those of you that filled out the pre-webinar questionnaire over the last several weeks. That information was really helpful in developing, you know, specifically what information we gave, and it helped me to understand that our audience is very diversified. We have several people that maybe haven't even heard of NPIC services or are not familiar with our mission, so I'm going to be taking time to go over a little bit about what is NPIC in addition to digging into how NPIC collects the data. So first I will be talking about who NPIC is. And then as I dig into the data that NPIC collects, I'll talk about how is it collected, what data is, it collect, is collected for all inquiries, and then what additional data do we collect and categorize for incidents. For those incidents, because that's additional information, I'll talk a little bit about our classification schemes, how we categorize that. And then last but not least, we're going to get into what the data request might look like and how to go about requesting that data from NPIC. So who is NPIC? NPIC is um, an organization that's a cooperative agreement formed between the United States EPA and Oregon State University. And we provide objective, science-based pesticide information with the main purpose or goal of promoting informed decision making. So the main way that we do this is by operating a toll-free hotline for individuals to call into, to ask questions, and to get really high-quality, detailed information. So our toll-free hotline is available from 8 a.m. to noon Pacific time, Monday to Friday. But then we also have a very extensive website where individuals can find lots of good scientific information that's easy to understand when we're not available via phone. And of course, we do take emails, and we hear a lot from voicemails as well. Per year, we take about 10,000 to 11,000 inquiries, and about 90% of the individuals that contact NPIC are general public. That's um, skewing it a lot towards the general public, which means that most of the questions we receive are about pesticide use in and around the home. Now, of those 10,000 to 11,000 inquiries per year, on average, about 15% of those calls are related to pesticide incidents. And we'll talk more about how NPIC classifies an incident, an incident, but it's typically some type of exposure, maybe it's a spill or a misapplication. This is April, one of our pesticide specialists, and the type of information you can expect when having a conversation is that the pesticide specialist is going to be able to translate technical scientific jargon into language that's much easier to understand. We know that not everybody has a background in science, and so that's one of our main goals is to um, really facilitate that communication without using technical jargon. We also understand that sometimes NPIC is not the only or best resource in an individual's overarching conversation about their situation. So we have an extensive database that we have maintained with state and other local contacts so that individuals can find that information when we're not available or we're, we're able to explain these resources to them over the phone and, and point them in the right direction. 
NPIC also has multilingual spe specialists on staff. And we have a contract with Language Line Solutions so that we can deliver pesticide information in real time in over 240 languages. However, I think that our strongest suit is our ability to evaluate pesticide risk and to communicate what that risk is to the individual with questions. So I'll talk a little bit about that, but mostly um, I think that we, we don't have time today to talk about how NPIC approaches that strategy of communicating risk. Instead, let's talk a little bit more about our, some of our services. NPIC could help if an individual had questions about two products and they wanted to compare product toxicity. Maybe they wanted to discuss the potential health effects if there were some type of, type of exposure. Maybe they wanted to evaluate pesticide persistence in the environment or wanted to talk about breakdown in water, in soil, or in air. And PIC can help discuss what those risks to groundwater, wildlife, bees, or pets, or, and of course family, what those risks could be. We can help evaluate and discuss them. We may be able to provide general label guidance, and I want to qualify this a little bit because if an individual isn't sure you know, how to find the pre-harvest interval on their product for applying it to a garden, that's general label guidance where we can talk with them over the phone, point them in the general direction on their language, where to look for that pre-harvest interval, explain what it means. Um, but this is not providing specific mixing or application instructions. We really do need that person to have the product on hand and to have the label available before they're going to be applying it. Some individuals contact NPIC to report pesticide spills or exposures. And in those instances, if time is not of the essence, if it's not an emergency, we'll talk about their options and also if there may be a more appropriate contact for them at their state or other level. Sometimes we hear about concerns for upcoming treatments. Maybe it's another non-urgent situation. We may be discussing integrated pest management for their specific pest, uh, but these are all scientific topics that end pickers are very comfortable discussing. Of course, it's important to talk about the limitations as well. And pick is not going to provide products or product recommendations. So it may be that they have a couple products they want to compare, and we're happy to do that. Unfortunately, we're not going to make a specific recommendation for their situation or for their past. And pick specialists do not have medical training, so we're not going to provide medical advice or any type of diagnoses. Now, it's it's confusing to some individuals because they may think that because we're giving health information about what's listed in the literature, that that can equate to a, a diagnosis, but we're very clear about our boundaries and we're just um, providing scientific information. Like I mentioned before, NPIC will not provide specific mixing or application instructions. Uh, if an individual doesn't have a label or is having a hard time understanding their label, that may be better for the manufacturer, or if it's a professional, it may be better to talk to the state lead agency. This is a surprising one, but I have had to answer this question many times. NPIC cannot provide legal advice, nor does NPIC have any regulatory or enforcement authority. And what this means is that NPIC is also not going to be sending any type of automatic reporting to regulatory authorities. By policy, NPIC does not collect personally identifiable information. What that means is that it's anonymous information we collect. Um, and in a situation where somebody wants to talk to the regulatory authority or has information about a concerning application, we are more than happy to discuss the situation with them, what NPIC is and isn't, and who the proper authority would be, oftentimes giving them that contact information for their state lead agency. Um, so we, we do very careful work to explain the role of the state lead agencies and other offices, and then we give them the contact information so that it's um, a first-person contact between them and the agency. So just very briefly looking at that, that one most popular question we get from our callers, is it safe? Um, this, this slide is meant to summarize our conversation around safety versus risk. So if we were to refer to a situation as safe, the answer is yes or no, it is or it isn't safe. And if we imply safety, then there may be that idea that no precautions are necessary. And that safe 
would be safe for everyone. Now, while this is very easy to explain, it isn't very accurate, and it doesn't help prevent possible exposures a lot of times. So instead, what we talk about is risk. There's a sliding scale where a situation involving pesticides can be more or less risky based on behavior, based on product, based on exposure potential. But there are always some precautions that you can implement to help reduce those risks. Also, we understand that risk can be higher for certain individuals. They may be having predisposed conditions that make that risk higher for them. Unfortunately, this is a lot harder to explain. So if you take one thing away from this conversation about safety versus risk, it's this. If you give the impression of safety, it can potentially lead to careless behaviors or a lack of vigilance, and that in turn can increase risk. Now, because of this, it means that every time we have a conversation about using pesticides or being present around pesticides, we're always going to provide actionable concepts that an individual can, can take on themselves, some of these precautions that they can um, help reduce their risk in that situation. NPIC's website, I mentioned this earlier, is um, one of our best resources, especially if we're not available via phone right away. Our website is over 700 pages in English and Spanish. It has lots of great educational publications. Lots of topics are covered about pesticides and uh, various topics. But I think one of my favorite parts is our local contacts, this map in the lower right-hand corner. Um, when you're on the web page, that map is pretty obvious. And it allows individuals to find contacts for various agencies in their state and maybe even on a more local level, maybe on a county level. Uh, it's got thousands and thousands of contacts for um, the United States, and so I would emphasize this as one of our resources, but also encourage you, if you're listening today, to check out the tool, and if your organization is represented and there is contact information provided there, please check and make sure it's up to date and correct, because we are trying to keep that as up to date as possible, and if there's ever a mistake, we would be happy to make that update to make it correct. So on our website, like I mentioned, we have these educational materials, and they can vary from videos to infographics to fact sheets. But what we're doing is we're taking the information we're hearing from our callers and from our inquirers, and we're leveraging that to create new publications based on what they need or based on what they're saying. So just as an example, here are a few of our fact sheets. We have, I think, over 40 active ingredient fact sheets, plus we have topic fact sheets. Um, and these, again, are written for the general public. They're written in a non-technical manner so that even someone without a scientific background has an easy time reading them. I would encourage you, if you deal with specific active ingredients in your line of work, and um, this is something I, I talk to pesticide applicators about, if you'd like, you can have these either saved in PDF or print them out and have them ready to hand out when needed, or if you have a public event coming up as well. Okay, so now that we've talked about who NPIC is, let's talk a little bit about the data that we collect. For every call, voicemail, and email, an NPIC specialist will document the essential elements of that conversation, which really is the who, what, where, when, and how of the situation. I have to place a caveat on the who because we don't collect personally identifiable information. We don't collect names or phone numbers. What this means is that uh, we're collecting relationships. We're collecting ages. So if a mother calls in and has information about her daughter or her stepmother, that information is reflected in the data that we collect, but it's not personally identifiable. So this is self-reported data, and it's important to emphasize that. None of the information that we are collecting has been verified by any type of independent investigation. We don't make claims about its accuracy other than the fact that we have tried our hardest to accurately reflect the information that was provided to us. So if um, an individual reports something to us, we like to act as a pane of glass and reflect it as closely as possible to their report. Um, we're categorizing all of these essential elements of the conversation into a custom database, which I'll refer to as the PID, but it stands for Pesticide Inquiry Database. So the process looks a little bit like this. We have a caller who may um, speak to an NPIC specialist. 
the NPIC specialist will collect essential elements of that conversation on a log, and then they will enter that data into the, the pesticide inquiry database. And that's just a picture of what the interface looks like in the lower right-hand corner there. So there's three main types of inquiries that NPIC receives. One of them is informational. This may be general information about an upcoming treatment. Um, maybe they haven't even started their pest control policy or, or um, they haven't started anything yet, but they're wanting to know more information about pesticides. Uh, maybe they're interested in learning about washing pesticide residues from produce, and this would all be informational. Another main type would be a pesticide incident. These are inquiries or reports where there's been an exposure, a spill, or some type of misapplication. And the least common, um, usually about 2% or less of all of our inquiries, these are other inquiries, and they're not related to pesticides. Sometimes they can be a little bit more than just a wrong number. Sometimes, sometimes individuals aren't really sure about um, what they're asking us if we become a quote-unquote ask a scientist hotline, um, but, but we do our best to get them pointed in the right direction. Now, the information that's collected, uh, it differs depending on if it's if it's an informational inquiry or if it's an incident inquiry. We do a better job of collecting more information and requiring more information for incidents. And over time, the database has continually improved. What that means is that what we're discussing today, we're focusing on that data that we collect today as opposed to some of the minor changes that may have occurred over time. So for every inquiry, every time someone contacts NPIC, we aim to collect their location based on their zip code or state, and that is as specific information as we're going to collect for their location. Maybe we'll want to know the type of inquirer. That means, uh, is it general public? Is it government or medical prof professional of some type? What kind of questions did they ask? Were they asking about health risk, regulation? Maybe they had questions about pesticide applications. What product information was relevant to that conversation? Could we collect an EPA registration number? Could we collect a product name? Or at the very least, maybe active ingredients were specifically discussed? And what actions did NPIC perform? Did we provide a discussion of ways to minimize exposure, or IPM? Did we provide a referral? Maybe we talked about what referral, which appropriate agencies would be useful in their situation based on their question. And then it's also important for us to collect how that person found NPIC. Uh, this, this comes up a lot because we're seeing more and more that individuals are finding, even our phone number, they're finding it based on uh, websites online. And we ask that question to them. So this helps us know the usefulness and where we can focus our efforts for our website. I'm going to actually talk about some NPIC data over the next few slides. And this is all data from NPIC 2017 annual report. The dates aren't exactly calendar year for 2017, but I'll refer to it off and on as 2017. So this is some data that we collected about the type of inquirer or the profession of the person who contacted NPIC. Vast majority of the individuals that contacted us were general public in 2017, so that was about 90%. But this is important for identifying our audiences. We noticed, just anecdotally talking around the office, we noticed we were getting more and more ca calls from professional beekeepers, from apiaries. And so in 2017, we decided to add that as a type of inquirer, as something that we could track over time. And all of this data is available in our 2017 annual report that is available on the NPIC website today. So if you um, think that I'm going too quickly over some of the data, you're always welcome to go visit that annual report. Here's an example of our types of question that someone may ask when calling NPIC. These are guidelines that help keep specialist coding consistent across everyone. Um, but also our top three questions are usually these same three, health, pest control, or pesticide application questions of some type. And you can have more than one question per call. Um, so if you're looking at the data and you're thinking we have double or triple the numbers from our actual increase inquiries for that year, that's why. You can have more than one type of question per call. 
This is just an example of a few of the actions that NPIC may code after a conversation. We may have sent outreach materials. We may have given a referral to an appropriate organization. We may have discussed risk reduction actions, and that can include talking about integrated pest management or um, discussing ways to minimize exposure. And so this is a list of the organizations that we may provide as uh, references during our call. We may provide contact information so that they, the caller can follow up with some of these organizations. So next, let's talk a little bit more about pesticide incidents. And I think that incidents are much pop, more popular with individuals that request data from NPIC. You can request informational data, but incident data is much more popular. Let's define an NPIC incident. This is an inquiry that involves some type of plausible exposure to a known or highly suspected pesticide. And that includes an unintended exposure to humans or animals, that can be something where it accidentally spills on a person or it sprays onto a dog by accident. They're not meaning to be exposed to it. An intended exposure with an adverse effect, and this seems like a strange one because why would we intentionally be exposed to pesticides, but there are pesticides like insect repellents where we do intentionally expose ourselves. So the adverse effect would be the unusual part of that circumstance. There may be a spill or a misapplication. And for misapplications, this is a very specific definition. We often require an EPA registration number in order to compare the label with the description of how the product was used. There are a couple exceptions. So for example, misapplications with mothballs, we don't need the EPA registration number because mothballs need to be used in a closed airtight container. So instead, what we're doing is we're basically getting a good description of how the product was used. Um, and then that helps us understand that it doesn't fit any uses for mothballs. Another example might be if an individual told us that they applied the product at two times the label rate. That doesn't necessarily require the EPA registration number because we're reflecting the information that they've given to us as clearly and accurately as possible. So in 2017, I, I mentioned that that number, it, it hovers around 15%, but in 2017, our actual data showed that we had 16% incidence of all of our inquiries. So here's the additional information that we aim to collect for incidents. We aim to collect the type of incident. You can think of these as exposures, misapplications, spills, drifts. Um, there are some more rare types of incidents like fire or industrial accidents, but like I said, they're very rare. We also aim to collect the entity or the type of entity that was exposed to the pesticide. This could be a human, this could be an animal, this could also be an environmental entity like um, plants, trees, a house, a, a structure, or a building of some kind. And then we aim to collect the location of the incident, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So if time is not of the essence, we want to collect a timeline describing the exposure duration, the onset of symptoms, and the symptom resolution. If, if time is not of the essence, we understand that sometimes it's an emergency, and our first priority is always to stop the ongoing exposure. We will also aim to collect the person or animal's age, their symptoms, and their gender. And then for animals, we aim to collect the species, breed, and weight as well. So here's a breakdown of those entities that I was talking about. In 2018, half of the entities that we heard about exposed to pesticides were humans, and that can include women, men, or groups of people exposed to the same thing at the same time, in the same way, with the same symptoms. For animals, we had mostly single animal exposures in 2017, but we did have a large amount of animal groups exposed at the same time and a small amount of wildlife. For the environmental entity, that's about a third of our incidents. That's referring to the built environment, plants, um, gardens, and this application to a garden, that would be considered the entity there. And you can see the list on the left that shows the entities that we classify. Other is very rarely used. Um, we recognize that sometimes all entities can fit into our, our perfect categories. 
So for incident location, um, I mentioned that this is helpful for us to have on hand because if you look at the very top result, overwhelmingly, most of the pesticide incidents reported to us in 2017, 90% of them occurred in the home or yard. And on the one hand, that makes a lot of sense because most of the individuals we're hearing from are general public, and so most of the time they're spending it in their home or yard. Um, but it's helpful because if you're in a state or an area where you're trying to get out informational leaflets or, or trying to establish an educational program for general public, you can dig into this data and you can find out more about how are the exposures happening. Are these mostly spills? Are these mostly misapplications? What's going on? And this location here is telling you that that's where most of the incidents are occurring from our data set. So what we also enter into the database is a narrative. And this isn't meant for you to specifically read necessarily, but it's to show you that for even a complicated incident, we strive to keep short, concise, and complete incident narratives. So this is entered into the database with the understanding that the information provided here in the narrative is the same information that's provided in the coding. And the idea being that a stranger could read this and would get the same coding if they had been trained on NVIX coding scheme. So you don't necessarily have to be available to hear that caller to understand the coding as long as you have that narrative that explains each and every piece of it. It's got product information, it should have location information, onset duration, and resolution of symptoms. All of that should be there. So how do we characterize the reported symptoms? Specialists will compare the symptoms and signs that they get from a caller to what's listed in case reports, books, or other parts of literature. And what they're focusing on are the active ingredients involved in this incident. So what we have created is something called a certainty index. This is our estimate as to the likelihood that the signs or symptoms someone is reporting, whether or not these are consistent or inconsistent, with published materials. So uh, we do use another code definite, and that's when something is consistent, and also we have laboratory results, blood serum levels, some kind of measurement, to back that up. Um, but as you can see, it's not a very common code. We usually have one to two a year, and in 2017 we had zero. Um, so it's typically consistent or inconsistent for animals and humans. And there are a lot of cases where we can't classify a certainty index when there's no exposure, or when there's an exposure but no symptoms, when there's no active ingredient that could be identified, and if we're not sure whether or not there are symptoms for that individual. We also can assign, we also do assign a severity index based on how severe the symptoms are, and this is independent of the certainty index. We have asymptomatic, minor, moderate, major, and death for the severity index, and it's based on a couple sets of criteria for humans and animals. So for humans, this was derived from the National Poison Data System used by the Poison Control Centers, as well as the Incident Data System used by the US EPA. For animals, the criteria for our, our coding scheme were adapted from the ASPCA's Animal Poison Control Center and the EPA's Incident Data System. So there are similar mechanisms out there for coding um, the severity index, but this is how NPIC has come up with their own. And then how do we ensure data quality? So the PID facilitator is, an, is a specialist here at NPIC that focuses on the, the data, keeping the data consistent over time and between specialists. So they review the data and they make corrections as needed to maintain that consistent approach. We also consult with Dr. Fred Berman on our executive committee. He provides input on incidents. Now, there's a lot of coding support for specialists because even after initial training, there needs to be a lot of ongoing help. And so what we do is we keep references available to all specialists um, where they can solve their coding questions based on past exercises or guidance. The PID facilitator may provide one-on-one -on -one coding guidance if there's questions or if there's a pattern emerging. And we also monitor trends during the QAQC process. And that helps us to identify if multiple people are having a similar trend. Maybe we need to do a group activity during our staff meetings um, and create some kind of specific training activity. So requesting and pick data. 
what are some of the things that NPIC data can tell us? They, it, it can tell us what is being reported by the general public. It can also tell us some of the circumstances leading to those exposures, and maybe even how serious the incidents are that are being reported. How many incidents are being reported, and is that rate changing over time, maybe even for a specific active ingredient? Is there a changing trend for that active ingredient or product? And what kind of topics are people asking questions about? So for example, over time, we've been tracking how people are asking questions about repellent products. Um, that they're specifically mentioning for use against mosquitoes that may carry the Zika virus. And so we noticed that trend in 2015, 2016, going down in 2017. Uh, but these are the kinds of things that we'll notice anecdotally, and then we can dig into the data a little deeper, and we can see trends over time. Just an example of a data request in the last couple years here, the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program um, and along with Cornell Cooperative Extension, they created these active ingredient profiles for those active ingredients eligible for minimum risk pesticide use. So minimum risk pesticides have a very specific set of requirements that they must meet, and then they don't require federal registration by the EPA as a pesticide. Um, so what these uh, profiles are doing is, is they're, they're looking at health information, reports of incidents, and NPIC data was just one small piece of these overall profiles. But they requested 20 years of NPIC incidents for each and every one of these eligible active ingredients. And they were able to kind of talk generally about um, you know, the volume of incidents related to poisonings and then dig into the written narratives to characterize how these exposures are occurring or what might be a, a common type of exposure. Other types of past reports We've had dozens of reports from EPA, requested from EPA personnel in the Health Effects Division, um, the Biopesticides and Pollution Prevention Division, as well as others at EPA. Um, some of these might look like maybe they want to know about all incidents that have a severity index of something above minor, so moderate, major, or death, and maybe those would all be related to active ingredients, and they're going to request it over the last five years. They may also be interested in incidents related to a specific product, maybe over 10 years or maybe just in the last year, and they can provide that EPA registration number for us to search for. Um, now, states, we've had many requests, dozens of requests from states as well. Maybe they're just interested in all reported incidents in their state for a specific time. Maybe they're looking for all animal incidents related to flea treatments across all states. Maybe they're looking for all incidents related to active ingredient poisonings. And these are examples of actual requests that we've um, gotten from states for NPIC data. So what does it look like when we fulfill a data request? Any information that we collect about that report will be provided. But by policy, none of that information will include personally identifiable information, and that's because NPIC doesn't collect that PII. The data can be provided in one way, by PDF, which essentially looks like one case narrative per page with some of that uh, all the related data included, but it can be more time consuming to filter through the data that way if you're looking at a large set. Alternatively, we can also provide data in a .csv format, which could be viewed or sorted in Microsoft Excel or imported into Microsoft Access. So you can think of this data in a couple of different ways. One of the ways it could be maybe you're looking for counts. Maybe you want to know how many people were exposed to a specific active ingredient and reported ocular symptoms over these years. Or, or something like that. So you're looking more at statistical information, and um, all of that data is provided to you. If you wanted to have both versions, you could have a PDF version and a spreadsheet version. Um, also, in the past, we found it easiest to create a custom format. So if that's something that's going to be helpful to you, we're definitely interested in helping you get the data you need. So let's talk more about who can request data from NPIC. If you are EPA personnel, which could include risk assessors, risk assessors, work groups, or administrators, or if you are um, state or tribal agency, maybe another type of state agency like a Department of Environmental Quality or a Health Department, all of these offices can request 
data from NPIC at no charge, and the report will be in your hands within 10 business days. We understand that other individuals, other groups also would like to request data for, for registrants, um, non-government organizations, or the general public. The process for requesting NPIC data is fee-based, and they'll have to do the entire process through Oregon State University's Office of General Counsel. Um, if they're having trouble getting in contact, we're always happy to redirect you via the hotline. So um, we always encourage you that if you're not sure where to go, if you're not sure who to contact, just contact the hotline and we'll get you to the right place. So I have a little bit better, more specific contact information than just using the hotline as a backup. If you are EPA personnel, you can contact our project officer, Ana Rivera Lupianez, and her contact information is there. I will end the presentation today on this slide when I'm finished, so um, you don't have to scribble down contact information right now. If you're with a, a state or tribal agency, maybe you're with a Department of Environmental Quality or a health department, you can contact myself, Project Coordinator Amy Hallman, or the Director, Jeff Jenkins. So let's look at a summary of what that data request process looks like. The first step is always contacting NPIC. Either you can use specific contact information, or if you're not sure, email or call our hotline. Oftentimes, it's helpful to discuss your specific data needs, to have a conversation, and usually that means phone call, uh, but if it's really simple request, it may not require a phone call. I would like to know at that time if you're interested in a PDF or a spreadsheet or both, what kind of statistical or detailed narrative information are you looking for? And that report will be delivered to you in 10 business days or fewer. Any follow-up assistance we can provide, any additional data you need, these are all available upon request. And actually, we really encourage you to follow up afterwards because it helps us understand how our data have been useful and how you're using it. So one of the questions we received during the initial questionnaire prior to the webinar being developed was about professionals entering information into a portal. One of our portals online available for including incident information at any day, any time, day or night is the Veterinary Pesticide Incident Reporting Portal, or the VERP. This is for use only by veterinarians and their staff or professionals in animal medicine. The information submitted to this online portal may be directly sent in its entirety to the US EPA. The data collected in this portal are not for targeted enforcement. And it is a separate set of data from the NPIC data sets I just was talking about. So there's no data quality control. Like I said, it could be submitted in its entirety as is without any vetting or QAQC. Um, I think it's an important tool to have available for medical professionals. However, if the individual was able to call in and talk to one of our pesticide specialists, the amount and type of data that we're able to collect over the phone is going to be much richer, higher in detail, and it's just going to be higher quality overall. So we usually encourage individuals to contact us through the hotline. But remember, this is a separate data set, and it's often a very small data set. Over the course of the year, um, it's often less than a couple dozen reports. Another online incident reporting portal we have is the Ecological Pesticide Incident Reporting Portal. This is for reporting adverse effects in the field to non-target entities like wildlife, birds, fish, plant, bees, soil, water. Um, again, it may be sent in its entirety to the US EPA, and it's not for targeted enforcement. It's separate from NPIC data as well, and there's no quality control. So what's important to mention about these portals is that they don't overgo our normal um, QA process. And if any personally identifiable information is included, like in the ECO portal, uh, that would be sent in its entirety. So uh, we don't have the ability to withhold that information. One last time, I'll put up some contact information. This may be for... Um, this is our general hotline, our general email or website. If you wanted to refer to NPIC or ask questions over the hotline to one of our pesticide specialists, I encourage you to just pick up the phone and call. We're open Monday to Friday, 8 to noon Pacific time. And like I promised, I'm going to end the webinar today on our contact slide. So we have time now. Um, and I say we because I'm here with the, the developer of the pesticide inquiry database, Sean Ross. 
and we're going to go over some questions that have been asked during the webinar. Okay, thanks so much, Amy. Um, I'm going to read some of the questions that we received, and then um, we can kind of all answer them as it seems appropriate. Um, so the first question we got was, how does MPIC staff ensure callers understand the label when getting inquiries about pesticide safety? That's a good question. Um, I think it, it depends a lot on, well, I mean, Alicia, you can help me answer this. It depends a lot on the person and how they're referring to the label. Right. So if they're asking questions that imply they haven't read anything about PPE requirements, it's kind of a red flag for the pesticide specialist to ask them if they have any questions about what they're seeing on the label. Yeah, and a lot of times, too, when we're speaking to a caller and they have a product they're going to be applying, um, we'll kind of walk them through the label section. So because we have access to the federal label, not necessarily state edited labels, we'll say, okay, can you find the section that says precautionary statements? Or can you find the section that has the list of the pre-harvest intervals? Um, what do you see listed there? And then we'll kind of step through each portion of it um, and help explain, you know, different segments of it and how that relates to pesticide um, safety, you know, the signal word or um, the preca precautionary statements and how those things are decided upon as well so they understand kind of the background of that information on the label has a whole regulatory step it goes through to get there and, and these are the things it means. Mm -hmm. And we generally ask, how are you intending to use the product? Mm -hmm. how, how do you want to apply it? And then right. that is where our conversation begins. Mm -hmm. And additionally, um, mm -hmm. you guys have a, uh, uh, a constantly are asking people to try to find the registration number for you on the label <laughs> and have that conversation and try to get people to get that so the active ingredient and registration number information. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep, Not because we're, we're always trying to get some product information off the label. So. Um, it, it would be a big red flag if we asked for any product information off the label and they couldn't give us anything. I mean, it could also be a problem with literacy, um, but I think that there are several things that could cue us into that conversation. Yeah, hopefully that answered your question. Feel free to ask again if we didn't quite touch on it. Um, the next question that we received was, how are misleading or false claims handled and how are they separated from real calls to fake claim calls? which is not something I think we've ever really come up with. Um, I mean, we haven't been able to identify things that are false claims necessarily. And I think that that's outside of our wheelhouse because our main purpose is to reflect the data as clearly as possible, understanding that it is self-reported data and that it hasn't been vetted in any way, shape, or form. So um, I think because you know, we're set aside from any kind of enforcement, that you know, we may be providing the correct information for this, the state pesticide agency for questions about enforcement, and then that might be their their jurisdiction. Yeah, to kind of identify but it's that. not reflected mm -hmm. in our data. It's a great question. I mean, if somebody is calling with um, kind of over the top reactions to things, or I mean, that would come out in the consistency. You know, mm -hmm. it would come out as being inconsistent to what's in the literature. Um, but the, so the report of exposure, would we would not pass judgment on mm -hmm. true or false report of exposures. Right. Because we hear crazy things. <laughs> and we want to document everything. Yeah. That's a possibility. So we kind of take people at their word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we have to. And we have to. <laughs> yeah. Um, how do you code the information if the caller used a generic name for a product, such as Roundup, but they don't provide the EPA number or specific product name? That's a really good question. Um, for a long time, we were able to code Roundup with active ingredient glyphosate because all Roundup products had that active ingredient. More recently, we understand that Roundup has Safe for Lawns products that are not with active ingredient glyphosate, but the same name of Roundup. Um, so if we know that a general name has every product with at least that one same active ingredient, we code that. But if it becomes known to us that there are multiple possible active ingredients, we reflect that uncertainty in our data, and we will include the name without the active ingredient. Now, let's say the specialist has a conversation because there's only two possible active ingredients. We'll code all three of those things separately, the name, active ingredient number one, and active ingredient number two, because we discuss both of those ingredients, and so we want to reflect that in our data as part of the topic of conversation. And the certainty index will reflect the symptoms 
mapping to those as well. Exactly. So if we have a case where there are symptoms and we're unable to identify the specific active ingredient, then we have an incident active ingredient unknown code. Um, and so that it does not allow us to assign a certainty index. We can still assign severity if there are symptoms, but if someone has no information about what the active ingredient is, we reflect that uncertainty. And again, you guys are great at trying to tease out those registration numbers if they have the label. Right. So, and that's the number one thing is trying to get that information from the caller in the first place. Yeah. And oftentimes we'll have calls with people where we will go through the entire conversation we would normally have if they had the full you know, information about the product, but say they're at work and their product's at home. Um, and we'll just have them call back later and provide that additional information and then we can piece that together with our original um, incident information so that we do have a more thorough mm -hmm. you know, report if possible. Yeah, so, if we have someone calling back, we do best to link up those reports so that it's all contained in one place. Mm -hmm. um, the only other slide or question that we have right now is whether the slides will be available. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I know that the recording of the webinar will mm -hmm. be available within two weeks. Um, you're very welcome to contact me directly for those types of questions for requesting slides and we can talk about it more. Mm -hmm. um, if you have any other questions, we'll wait um, you know, another 30 seconds or so and give you guys a chance to type those in. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, we are coming to the end. Yes, and we have, I think we have a little over 10 minutes left before we hit um, the hour. Uh, so we're going to stay on and wait for those questions. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Okay. Um, we've got another question that says, do you prefer that data requesters cast a wide net when requesting or to make more than one separate narrower data request? That's a really good question. And I think that narrower, narrower data requests can more poignantly um, answer maybe questions that you have. However, sometimes we may do scoping reports where someone maybe doesn't know what data are available. And so that might be a more statistical report where there's going to be lots of hits. And then they're going to look at the noise in that data and say, OK, maybe what I wanted instead was a more um, focused report. And that might be something where we provide PDFs and you can dig into the narrative. So it definitely depends on your needs. And that's why one of the steps in the process is to have a conversation about what your needs are. If you're just curious and you're throwing out ideas, um, you know, let's pick one, stick with it, and see where it goes from there. Yeah, and it's as the as the database guy, um, I lots of people talk to Amy, and then she'll come to me and say, um, "Hey, somebody's interested in getting uh, reports uh, for the last five years in this state about um, this and this and this." Um, what's that going to look like? And I can very quickly do just some counts, just some raw numbers of incidents in that state for this AI and say, hey, that, that's, there are only five of these, right? Or there are 500 of these, and that can help inform in that, that uh, interaction and, and the, the final reports. So we can do some of those initial, those initial checks before doing a full official report if that will help you guys um, uh, get what you need. So and that and that may say, okay, well let's do a combined report with multiple AIs or let's let's pull one out that's that's smaller or whatever. So we can definitely do that. And that's uh you just want to talk to us about it and we're we're happy to help however we can. Absolutely. Thanks for those really good questions. If you haven't tried an NPIC data request in the past, I encourage you to try that. Um, but otherwise, we'll just hang around for a few more questions. Oh, there is. Yeah, we have uh, we have one in the chat window here. Oh. That wasn't in the. Okay, the looks window. like we have another question. Um, so they ask, do you track whether a call and or an exposure is occupational? If so, how is that documented, and what details are included in that data? That's a great question. I'm actually going to flip back through my slides quickly to some information about exposures. Doop. Um, so, if you see about halfway down, right before the accidents list starts, we do categorize occupational accidents or uh, occupational exposures, I should say. So, these are exposures that occur while they're at work that have to do with their line of work. Um, so, the, the number is, it's not as large as we have for the specific route of exposure, but we would code that in addition to routes of exposure or in addition to any kinds of spills or misapplications that would occur as well. So there's nothing that would limit our use of that occupational code. Mm 
questions. Okay, no other questions yet. We'll leave everyone um, just a couple more minutes. If you're leaving us today, I want to thank you for joining us for the webinar. The, the recording will be posted within two weeks, and you will get an automated email notifying you that when it's available. Okay, I see we're losing people. So again, thanks everyone. We're going to go ahead and end the webinar now. Um, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out and contact NPIC or me personally. Thanks.